Hey guys, welcome to the Drum History Podcast. Uh, today is a really cool episode because this one is the Gear of Ringo Starr. This one originally aired in March of 2020 as just audio. So this one is going to be, you're going to hear the audio from 2020, but you're going to see tons and tons of historical photos, videos, everything that matches up to what you're hearing in the interview. So it really brings it to life and uh, gives this episode the kind of life that it deserves um, on YouTube, as opposed to just being a normal audio podcast episode. Um, so a huge thank you to my friend Nish, who made this video for me. I hope you like this. Um, I'm going to put Nish's um, social media handles in the description. You can check out his stuff, Gary and Ringo's new book. I'll put all that down there as well, so you can check it out. And I hope you enjoy this episode and learn about one of my favorite drummers, Ringo Starr. Welcome to the Drum History Podcast. I'm your host, Bart Vanderzee, and today I am joined by Gary Astridge, who is a historian and curator of all things Ringo. Gary, how are you? Very well, Bart. Nice to talk to you. You too. Thanks for being on the show. Um, Ringo is one of those drummers that is just, I mean, he is one of the most well-known and famous and I would say best drummers in the world. And I know that's debatable when people compare him to guys like, you know, Buddy Rich or something, but I'd say he is just, he made drums what they are today. So, um, this is great. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I think I'm a little bit jaded, <laughs> but, um, uh, um, being, being a Beatles fan, Ringo's fan, uh, from a very young age, you know, I, I grew up with them and, um, sure. Uh, knowing him now, you know, watching him play, you know, physically, you know, standing behind him, watching him behind a kit. It's, uh, it's, um, it's, it's amazing. It, it, yeah. it, he's, he has that magic touch. He does. I think this episode can just be treated as all things Ringo. So why don't we just start with, um, can you give us some history on Ringo, a biography on, on him? Uh, you don't need to go too crazy detailed, but I think it's, it's really cool to learn more about him as a person. All right. Well, um, you know, Ringo was a sickly child in Liverpool and um, spent uh, a lot of time in, in the hospital at a young age, um, uh, almost died a few times in the hospital. And um, uh, while he was in there, you know, he, he, uh, he, he said that he uh, that that's where he had an interest in drums. You know, he said that the, the uh, nurse uh, would come by with a, with a little uh, cart with with um, different uh, instruments in it and um, you know to give the kids something to do and he was just always attracted to, towards uh, towards the drums and um, uh, when he was 15 uh, his stepfather got him a used drum kit for uh, uh, Christmas and um, <laughs> Ringo said that uh, uh, he went upstairs and he had a very small um, you know two up two down, uh, um, a flat uh, that, and, and in which he lived with his mom and, and stepdad, and it was like a row house. You know, so as Ringo started playing, and the neighbors were telling him to, you know, keep the noise down. So, so, so that really started him uh, uh, the mindset that just didn't like practicing. You know, so he just he just loved playing with with uh, uh, live musicians. And um, anyway, he got hooked up with Rory Storm and the Hurricanes. They were a big band in um, in Liverpool. And Ringo spent a lot of time uh, in the summers. They would have these three month gigs uh, at at these holiday camps. And you know, when Ringo would be there playing with the band, they would play all kinds of music. So he really learned uh, a lot of different styles. And from there, he went on to the Beatles um, when they made him an offer in August of '62. And hmm. uh, uh, the rest is history. Now, how old was he at that point? When, uh, when let's let's say when he when he. So, give me some ages here. So, when he first got into music, just help me get the he timeline. About, he was about thirteen. Okay, and then the next kind of when he when he decided I'm going to be a professional musician. Yeah, fifteen, sixteen. Okay, and then how old he, was he when he started in the Beatles? Uh, well, he went in at uh, August of sixty. He was born in forty, so he'd be twenty two years old. Okay, and obviously he famously replaced. Pete Best, who was the drummer before, who when the Beatles, uh, what's the story with that? Um, what what happened there with Pete Best? You know, I, I guess there, there there's a lot of different stories out there. Um, you know, I, I sifting through a lot of the information. And this is this is my interpretation. You know, when 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 the uh, John Paul and George uh, had an opportunity, um, they needed a drummer, so they asked. Asked Pete, and, and and he obliged because he had nothing going on. But 
John Paul and George, in my well, it, it's 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 pretty much factual. They yeah. had the drive, they had the, the desire, and obviously they they had uh, an overwhelming uh, talent. Pete was just along for the ride, so mm. he didn't have that fire in the belly, and um, uh, I think it was just showing time and time again. And and Ringo had it, and then I think sure. that that was the reason they wanted Ringo in the group because he had he was of the same mindset and had the talent. That makes sense. Um, okay. So then he gets in the Beatles, and as you said, the rest is history where um, basically people see them on the Ed Sullivan show, and uh, Ringo has, is one of those guys who have come up in, I would say, you know, every second or third episode of Drum History, someone mentions the Beatles. If it's about Ludwig, if it's about vintage Japanese drums, about how that just kind of, you know that boom of making kids want to play the drums and learn um, basically stems from seeing Ringo play. So, I mean, I, I feel that he has kind of a responsibility of, of making the, uh, the drums become such a popular instrument because, um, you know, before him, there was a lot of jazz guys, obviously, but um, it was just different, right? Oh, yeah. And, and I was one of, uh, you know, kids that got turned on uh, by by the Beatles, you know, I, I was um, seven uh, at the time when I when I saw them on the Ed Sullivan show, and it was interesting for me because um, I was just a kid. I didn't have any interest in in music at all. And um, when they when they came on, you know, I just saw the way my family reacted, and uh, uh, I I just like laid locked on on Ringo. And the following day, my parents told me that um, I was banging on empty coffee cans and. And everything for me started right at that at that moment. So that's so funny. Cool. Now, um, well, let's maybe pause here right in the middle, and then you can kind of talk about. We can go back and talk about the historical stuff. But um, then, why don't you tell us what it is that you do, and then we can go back and talk about some of his gear throughout the years and all that uh, good stuff. But um, so, what got you into being basically an independent historian and curator of? Uh, of Ringo's gear. Okay. Um, as I said, you know, I, I uh, was attracted to the Beatles when, when they hit the Ed Sullivan show. And um, uh, even though at an early age, uh, I didn't know anything about drums, anything about music. I just found myself fascinated with, with, with drums. And, and I was zooming in on, on Ringo's kit. And I just remember, you know, uh, uh, looking at the album covers, you know, getting magazines when I could. And, um, uh, what had happened was I, I started noticing that there were some differences in uh, Ringo's drum kits and the look of them as, as the uh, a year starting going by, you know, from 64, 65, 66. And uh, um, I didn't realize till later when, when I was a, a young adult that, wow, Ringo actually had different kits. It just wasn't one Oyster Black Pearl kit. And um, uh, the, I started doing more research and it became a passion and so along with research, I started uh, collecting vintage uh, drum kits, all specific to what Ringo used. And over the decades, I've managed to amass a collection of uh, drum kits and gear, all specific to what he had. And uh, by collecting, that really helped with my research. And in, what, 2002, I think, a gentleman by the name of Andy Babuke came out with a uh, a, a book called Beatles Gear. And uh, when I went through the pages and was focusing on the drums, I, I realized that a lot of the information that I uh, researched um, was matching what he was saying. Uh, I just went to a much deeper level uh, with, with drums. And at one point I, I thought, okay, you know, what do I do with all this information? And I thought I'd, I'd like to share it, you know, maybe because I knew there was other people that wanted a Ringo kit and I figured, uh, if I created a website, ringosbeetlekits.com, that that would allow people to learn about uh, his kits and the blueprint was there for them to go ahead and uh, find what they uh, they needed. And hmm. um, uh, for, for me, what ended up happening, here's where things go off the rails being a Beatles fan. Uh, it was uh, late 2012. I get a call from the Grammy Museum uh, in Los Angeles. And they said, um, Hey, we're going to give you some confidential information here. We, we just signed an agreement with, with Ringo and his wife, Barbara. Uh, we're doing a, uh, an exhibit on his life called Ringo, Peace and Love. 
And they said, so they're loaning us a lot of personal things, a lot of Beatle memorabilia. Uh, and among them, two key components are the drum kit Ringo used on the Ed Sullivan show uh, to, to, to indicate the beginning of his, his career with the Beatles. And then uh, uh, the Maple kit, the one that Ringo used on uh, part of the White Album on Let It Be and on Abbey Road to signify the end of his career with the Beatles. And they said, but we've run into a problem. Um, they said, that even though Ringo gave us approval, when we contacted his people in, in London uh, to obtain the kits, they said, you know what, uh, nothing's organized. We just have all kinds of drums here. And uh, so the people at the museum were frantically looking for information online, and all I kept finding was my website. So that's, that's how I initially got involved uh, uh, working with Ringo. That's awesome. So um, you are very much amongst drum nerds and friends here who are very interested, I think, in all the details about Ringo's drums, um, including his involvement with Ludwig, if that was always the case, um, what particular drums and finishes and, and all that stuff that I'm sure you know, like the back of your hand. So um, why don't you kind of take us through through Ringo's drums through the years? Okay. Um, well, uh, what had happened was Ringo had a, uh, an Ajax drum kit, uh, you know, like a, uh, a lesser type model uh, made in England uh, that, that, that he was using. It was the first kit that he bought. Uh, and um, uh, in September of um, 1960, uh, at a at a music store in Liverpool, he went in and he bought a a, a premier drum kit that that had the color of um, a mahogany duroplastic, and it was uh, a four piece kit, you know, a four by um, fourteen Royal Ace snare drum, a twelve by eight tom, a twenty by fourteen bass drum, and a sixteen by sixteen uh, floor tom. So uh, he bought that, and the reason he did was because uh, the beginning of October, he was traveling with um, his band, Roy Storm and the Hurricanes, to play in Hamburg, Germany. And they, uh, when they got there, they landed up being on the bill uh, above the Beatles, but they were playing with them. And that's where wow. we got to uh, meet John, Paul, and George. And uh, um, so Ringo used that kit extensively. And, uh, and he had it when he joined the Beatles in uh, August of 62. And um, uh, it served him well. Uh, you, hear, you hear that kit on uh, the Beatles' first album, the Please Please Me album. So when you hear Twist and Shout, um, you know, that, that's that kit. Hmm. Um, so what happened was in April of 63, uh, you know, it was decided that um, Ringo really needed to um, step up um, to, to a high-end kit. And, and he uh, um, always had a passion uh, for, for wanting uh, an American-made kit. And uh, um, I talked to him about this, and, and, and he, he said that uh, he went to a music store called Drum City in, in London uh, with, with uh, the Beatles' manager, Brian uh, Epstein. And uh, he said that there was this Oyster Black Pearl uh, Ludwig kit there. And he said, that's what I want. Um, so it was a, a smaller size kit, uh, 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 12 by 8 Tom. It was a downbeat set, uh, a, four by, um, a 20 by 14 bass drum and a 14 by 14 floor Tom. So uh, uh, Ringo gets the kit, but he doesn't take ownership of it right then and there. Um, I asked him uh, about the snare drum because Ringo had a, uh, a jazz festival snare drum. And um, it was documented that Ringo uh, got the kit, um, you know, from Drum City uh, in April of 63. Uh, but I told him that in, in going over and documenting his drum kits, I said, your snare drum is somewhat unique. You know, it, it's not a traditional jazz festival that's 5 by 14. I said, did you yeah. Did you know yours is five and a half by fourteen? And he said, "No, I didn't." And I says, "Well, did you did, did you uh, you must have special ordered it?" You know, I says, "I don't know what kind of snare drum uh, originally was with the kit when you bought it." And I says, "But there's a stamp date inside your snare drum that says, uh, you know, April eighteenth, nineteen sixty three. So the snare drum was made in Chicago. It's uh, you, you you must you, you must have special ordered it." You know, and he said, you know, he goes, I wanted a, a deeper sized 
uh, snare drum. I, I wanted uh, 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 a, a deeper sound in the studio. So mm-hmm. I said, wow, okay, so, so you answered that. Yeah. And um, with that particular snare drum, it lands up that um, uh, it, he, he, just, he just bonded with it. That was like his snare. So he landed up using that snare all the way through the end of uh, the Beatles. Even, even though he had different drum kits, he just, that was his go, go-to snare drum. So what happened was in, um, uh, when, the, when, when the Beatles were coming to the, uh, the States for the Ed Sullivan show, uh, it was decided that uh, Ringo would get uh, another kit, just like the one that he, uh, the, the Ludwig kit that he, that he now had. And the reason was uh, um, they knew, or Brian knew, that the Beatles were going to be um, filming A Hard Day's Night in March of uh, uh, 64. So they thought, okay, what better than to get the kit when we're in the States? So an order was placed through Drum City uh, to the Ludwig Drum Company. And then the drum kit was delivered to Manny's Music Store in New York City. And uh, so when Ringo came across with the Beatles, you know, he brought his snare drum, uh, his jazz festival, mm-hmm. like, brought his cymbals, and, um, and they brought a new bass drum head. Uh, that's, you know, uh, with the, the Beatles drop T logo. And uh, um, so on February 9th, the same day that they performed on the Ed Sullivan show is when Ringo took possession of that uh, kit. Mm. And um, so it was just used for a short period of time. And it was it's the same kit you see on the, uh, the movie A Hard Day's Night. The drum head was changed uh, uh, for another Beatles drop T logo. And um, uh, in... May, May 31st of 64, Ludwig provided Ringo uh, free of charge with his first drum kit. And that was a super classic model, you know, 13 by 9 tom, 16 by 16 floor tom, and 22 by 14 uh, bass with, a, with another jazz festival, traditional 5 by 14. Man, that was a uh, good move on uh, Ludwig's part there. Yeah. And, and one thing that I found out um, about that, um, there was a, a gentleman by the name of Dick Shorey. He was an executive at Ludwig, and um, uh, he's in his 80s, um, and we've become friends. And in fact, I was at his house um, uh, last summer asking him a lot of questions and interviewing him, and, and I learned some interesting things. He said that um, uh, when, after the Beatles were on the Ed Sullivan show, uh, uh, Bill Ludwig um, uh, uh, II uh, gave... Um, Dick, the job of being the liaison, working with Drum City and uh, Brian Epstein uh, to provide whatever Ringo uh, uh, would need. So he said that um, uh, they were trying to figure out at that time, you know, uh, uh, what kind of kit can we give Ringo? You know, uh, they're going to be playing in in, uh, 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 venues that are so unique at that time. How are we going to get the volume out? You know, and as you know, or uh, maybe know that, you know, when, when the Beatles performed, they didn't have monitors, they just had amps and, you know, it was very, very simple, you know, and, and it yeah. was Ringo, you know, just pounding away in the background. So he said that, you know, he even, uh, he was sending different drums to, to, for Ringo to try. And, and he says you know, one of them was even like a, uh, a 24 by 14 bass drum. And, um, and it sounds like things got too complicated. So Ringo just, just, just settled on a super classic kit. Hmm. So, um, so, so the one that he had was uh, made in 64 and he used that predominantly un- until he got his maple kit in, uh, 68. Wow. So, so that was his, that was his go-to drum kit, uh, on a majority of the albums. Now, is he a gear head? No, like, is he a- no, no, not at all. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, I kind of like that. You know, it's like, he's like, give me the drums and I'll play them and I don't really care, you know? Yeah, he know he knows what he wants sound wise, um, but but he's yeah, but he's not he's not a drum geek at all. Hmm. Um, yeah, a little side note because even a lot of times if, if I'm not a lot of times, but if I'm with him and somebody brings up something about his gear or whatever, he'll just he'll just point at me and just say, "Ask him." I don't know. <laughs> well, it was kind of cool. <laughs> That's awesome. You can yeah. speak for Ringo. That's yeah. you've earned that right. Yeah. So. Um, but anyway, um, we're getting close to the end here. So in '65, when the Beatles did their uh, 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 summer tour, uh, Ludwig supplied Ringo with another um, super classic kit. And it was really just used for the tour. And then uh, after the fact, uh, maybe in the studio just for um, du- you know, uh, uh, double tracking. 
Uh, but Ringo has a fondness for that kit. He calls it his Shea kit because that's the one he used, you know, at Shea Stadium in front of mm-hmm. 7,000 people. And um, uh, in, in 1968, uh, it's kind of a cool story that I unearthed. Uh, Beatles, the Beatles go to uh, India. Ringo's only there for a few weeks um, and he comes back early, but the other three are there. And uh, Donathan, um, um, do you know of him? Yes. Uh, yeah. Okay. So, no Sunshine Superman, all that kind yeah. of stuff. So he was influential uh, um, uh, in, in giving the Beatles a lot of inspiration. You know, he, he taught John and Paul like the claw hammer technique um, of guitar playing. And um, he, he mentioned to them that if they sanded the finish off their guitars, uh, they would have more of an organic sound. And uh, uh, so what, what they did was, uh, I think, with, with Paul pushing a little bit, they, uh, they experimented where Ringo um, was, took his one super classic kit that he was using from 64, and then he, and then he uh, um, mixed in his uh, uh, maple kit. You know, so he was trying double bass, and I guess oh, it, cool. yeah, but it just didn't work out. So, so that was that was scratched. Um, but uh, um, Ringo used that kit uh, with with the jazz festival once again, and he used it both with calfskin heads and with uh, mylar heads or plastic heads. You know, and and I think they changed up. You know, like when Ringo was playing on the rooftop, you know, that obviously the, the calfskin would have been uh, uh, um, difficult to deal with with constant tuning. So, sure. So, so they just went with the uh, uh, plastic heads. Man, and it's it's funny because it seems so like like now if someone says, "Oh, I went to the studio and recorded a major album or major songs with calfskin heads," I'd be like, "That's insane! No one does that." But I guess if you think about it, this isn't that long after the mylar synthetic heads had been invented. I mean, that was what like fifty seven ish, fifty six that I think Evans and. Remo were going at it. So this really isn't that far after that, where I guess they were still sort of, you know, in vogue a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. And and actually when Ringo went to the calfskin, it was almost like going back to what he originally started with because his premier kit, according to Ringo had uh, calfskin heads. Hmm. So um, I found, I found that very interesting. Yeah. From there, take it. What, what else did he use? Uh, That was, that was uh, predominantly it. So, but what happened was, so Ringo, um, as of what, two, uh, 2015, you know, ironically, he still, he still owned, uh, uh, five of his, um, six original Beatle drum kits. The one that, that, that is lost to history was his premier kit when, the, oh. when they made the deal, uh, to, to, uh, with drum city to, to purchase his first Ludwig kit. Uh, they, uh, took his premier kit in on trade. And um, uh, so what had happened was it was May 12th of uh, uh, 63. Uh, the Beatles were uh, performing on a TV show up in Birmingham, England, and it was a Sunday. So um, the, his kit was delivered then. You know, it was, so, so he actually technically bought it in April, but, but he took possession of it on May 12th. And uh, so, so his kit came back to the shop. I met and know the guy who... Uh, um, uh, detailed the kit before it was sold. Oh, cool. and um, his ma- is his uh, name uh, is escaping me, unfortunately. But the cool way that I got uh, in touch with this guy, I was when I was documenting uh, the 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 nineteen sixty four super classic kit of Ringo's. I took off the uh, uh, top head off of his uh, Tom. And there was a business card inside. Dave Golding was the guy's name. <laughs> Dave Golding, Drum City. And I'm going like, oh my God, this has been in there for 50 years. <laughs> and, um, so it, 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 I, I land up finding him. I track him down. I called him. And, and it was funny because with him having the uh, you know, like a British accent and me, me trying to explain who I am and what I found and him being in his 80s, it, it took oh. a while to, for it to click. But once it did, this guy was very sharp, very articulate, and then so he he started telling me a lot of details, you know. And uh, uh, he said, "I remember taking that kid in," and and he said, uh, "He goes, I remember cleaning up." He goes, and I remember that he goes, they, there was a he goes a felt sash in the front that said the Beatles, and he says, "He goes, it was just dirty and filthy." He goes, "I threw it out." 
you know. And, uh, <laughs> My God. Yeah. So so it was just an amazing story, and this guy had so much information. You know, he Gosh. where he he started out in '63 at Drum City, working in the um, uh, service department. So he would he would be you know working on the kits, setting things up, you know, making the deliveries and things like that. And uh, so, so he was the, the gentleman that installed the, like, Rogers Swivomatic Tom mounts on, on, on Ringo's kits. Hmm. And uh, uh, so, so he landed up leaving uh, Drum City in 1967. And, and when he left, he left as the store manager. Um, so so, so the, 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 the information that he had give, given me was just... Um, uh, so detailed and uh, uh, precise, and and I landed up meeting other people that worked at Drum City that worked under him, and those three other gentlemen all said, "Dave Golding said it. It's true." Man, uh, yeah. So so it was great to, uh, to 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 learn that history. Yeah. Well, and I think everyone owes you a debt of gratitude for actually taking these kind of oral histories like that and literally. Uh you know, taking drum heads off and finding cards and getting to the bottom of it and uh, then being able to, you know, put it all into one place. Now, I'm assuming because you didn't say anything about it and you said it was lost to history, that premiere kit is just, I mean, realistically, it could be in someone's garage or attic somewhere, Ringo's original premiere kit. Yeah, it could be. There was a story that, that, that it landed up in Australia. You know, you said, I'm the guy who bought it, you know, and... Uh, I said, please write down all the details, getting the kit, you know, like where you were, what you did, you know, and, and so, so he gave me a very detailed story. And unfortunately, some of the things that he said don't match up with uh, Beatle history. Yeah. And, um, uh, so it was like, you know what, I, this, isn't, this isn't really <laughs> um, uh, sounding like it's totally correct. So... Hmm. Uh, you know, he, he had up, he had up, up, um, he goes, I, I have a photo of me, uh, with the kit, uh, that was in a newspaper, you know, and, uh, in Australia and he sent it to me, but it was, it was really hard to make out the image. And, uh, you know, so, so if, if it was a clear image, then, then you could see the, uh, the, uh, uh, the way the swirl patterns were or are on the, uh, uh, the drums, of the you know mahogany duroplastic finish and then mash them up with pictures of Ringo's kit. Uh, so no, there is no real way to do that. No, no, that's interesting. It's one of those things where, let's be realistic. Everyone wants to be a part of Beatles history. So to say that you know I've got a Ringo's original premiere kit is probably just you know it may be it. But if you can't tell, then you know who knows. But um, you mentioned that he used Roger Swivomatic hardware on there, which a lot of people did in that day because it was kind of the most advanced um, hardware. And I know Ludwig's stuff wasn't the best uh, at that era, even up through the 80s and stuff. Uh, it wasn't great. But um, what other... So was he using like a Speed King pedal, I would imagine? Yeah, Speed King pedal. And uh, when when Ringo started out early on with his premiere kit, you know, he had like uh, a, an Ajax symbol you know he had zildjian's and um and zin uh, yeah believe it or not you know which in, i mean anyone that i've found was pretty crappy yeah you see those in like uh in just ca looking through catalogs it's always like uh well we we offer zin or whatever and these in these other uh like gretch had some and and it's just an interesting um i guess you got to sell a, a you know a starter kit with something so right. um well that's really interesting so uh now where are these kits now? You said uh, Ringo had five out of six of them. The premiere's gone. Um, where are they today? Okay, um, here's a story on those. Um, uh, in out of the five kits that he had in 2015, he sold one in December of 2015 at auction through Julian's auctions. And um, a little bit of a little bit of a background, just so all this makes sense. I, I, I should lie this in first. When I was going through Ringo's kits and putting everything back together, you know, uh, at that time, majority of the hardware was all missing, you know, symbols are missing. And, and, and I pitched the idea of, you know what, <laughs> you can't, you can't just put these, you know, drum kits, if you ever do, and, and, you know, out for display in a museum or something with the, the, the Beatles logo drum head missing, no stands, you know. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, like, oh, it's the Beatles, it's you, you know. So I said, I, I, I have a, a, an idea I want to throw by you. 
and, and I said, I go, I have a collection of drum kits and gear all specific to what, to what you use. I said, let me provide that, uh, the, the, whatever is needed to bring your five drum kits back to life, to make them whole again. And a um, uh, little side note, his maple kit was really, really in bad shape. It was, the hardware was oxidized. Mm. And, um, it was, it was, it was the, the inside of the shells smelled like um, uh, uh, mildew. Yeah. And um, so, so I said, you know, we, we, we got to correct all this stuff. So, so he gave me the go ahead. So, you know, I was able to, 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 to have all his kits right now look um, as they did when he used them. And so, uh, it was part of the process working with Ringo's um, drum tech, Jeff Chonis. You know, we ordered custom drum cases, uh, road cases to to put every kit in, and uh, along with details of how to set them up. So, like once I'm dead and gone, you know, uh, everything is in the case to to to, to uh, uh, give direction as to how to properly set up the kit the way Ringo uh, uh, used it. But um, uh, so, so that being said. Uh, going back to December of 2015, so Ringo has the auction, uh, and he sold off his first Ludwig kit, and um, it sold for 2.1 million dollars. Oh and, my God! And, yeah, and it did not include the snare drum, the jazz festival that came with it, the one that Ringo liked. He, he, yeah, he, he just said that's not going anywhere. Oh so my God! He kept that. So with with the inf- with, with with the gear that I provided. Um, you know, that was all documented, you know, for anyone that, that uh, uh, was looking to bid on the kit. And uh, uh, so the, the, the uh, uh, gentleman that purchased it uh, was uh, Jim Ursay, owner of the Indianapolis Colts. And, uh, um, you know, so he was well aware because in reality, <laughs> with, with what he bought for $2.1 million, uh, uh, 2.1 million was... Uh, the tom, which was original, the floor tom, which was original, uh, the bass drum, uh, which was original, but what wasn't was the uh, um, uh, front bass drum head, the mm. front hoop, the the um, uh, key rods and claws, uh, all of the uh, stands, the the speed king pedal, the cymbals, uh, the stool, all that was mine. That was your donor. Yeah, that was yeah. Well, Ringo actually bought you know the the, the things from me, but but really, Ursay didn't really get a lot, you know, oh. original things um, uh, from it. But he's Jeez. a good guy. He he's uh, I I was at his office twice, um, uh, once to tweak the kit to, uh, for, uh, to have it set up right, and the um, uh, second time we were doing a documentary on something, and I was asked to be there. But uh, a little FYI. Um, uh, that drum kit is currently on display at the uh, uh, Creative Artists Agency in Los Angeles. You can cool. you can Google it, but it, it's it's you can see it in the lobby. Um, it's it's there free of charge to to to, to see. It's encased and wow. it'll be there. Uh, I, I installed it in November of last year, and it'll be there until November of this year. Hmm. That's awesome. Yeah, everyone should go check that out if they if they're in that area. Now, is yeah. he a drummer? Who the, the uh, Colts owner who bought him? No, just a big Beatles fan. He also he also owns, I think, four Beatle guitars. Oh wow! This possession, yeah, yeah, cool. So things you can buy when you're a billionaire. Yeah, I mean, you you. It's funny because before you were like two million. I mean, two point one million, and I'm like that point one is enough is more expensive <laughs> than any drum set that I could think of. So oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it was the most. Yeah, and so Ringo loved me after that one, you know, knowing what oh. he had before I got involved. And and you know what else is interesting about Jim Ursay? Uh, in November of 2015, the month before, Julian's had uh, an auction of uh, a variety of uh, rock and roll memorabilia, and what went up for auction at that uh, at, at that time was the Beatles bass drum head from the Ed Sullivan show, mm. and Jim Irsay bought that for two million fifty thousand dollars. Oh my god! Yeah, so, so he's a big Beatles fan. <laughs> oh man, that's crazy. Now, yeah. did Ringo? I mean, there's no judgment either way. Now, did he just keep that money, or did he like donate that to yeah, you know? 
actually, it's pretty cool. What Ringo did was um, he and his wife Barbara a number of years ago started a uh, a, a, a charitable foundation called uh, the Lotus Foundation, hmm. and um, uh, they both know, you know, meaning Ringo and Barbara, that they uh, have been blessed in in their lives. So uh, they formed this foundation to help. Uh, uh, people um, long after they're dead and gone, majority of their fortune is just going to go. It's not going to the kids. It's going, going into the foundation to, to help people. And um, some of the things that, that is going to is, you know, there were certain things that, that uh, were negative in, in Barbara and Ringo's life is, you know, sorry, the alcoholism, uh, um, uh, uh, Ringo's daughter uh, having brain cancer at one oh, point. Um, so, so there's certain things where every year, Money is going to 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 specifics, and uh, yet they they also allow people to email them, write them, to suggest um, uh, other charities. So so they'll take a portion of the money every year and uh, give it to someone, uh, give portions to or to different uh, uh, causes. Mm, so that's great. So yeah, so it's very very touching, and so so he's really well grounded, and um, uh, just to be able to give back the way he is is just. Uh, uh, a, a nice thing because you know when I first <laughs> found out that Ringo was putting his uh, drum kit up for Sam, go come on! I go two <laughs> years ago. I just I go I, I just I just put it all together. You know maybe I couldn't have done any of that. But once I understood, you know that they needed the wow factor, and then once yeah. I understood that uh, what Ringo's plans were. So, but that auction I think raised um, uh, nine point two million dollars. Oh man. Yeah, with other gear that he was selling and stuff no, like that. It wasn't, it wasn't only gear; it was just like you know things from you know different houses because because they even sold off some of their properties. They're just downsizing because you know oh, they're wow. older. So it's like you know anything from like you know candelabras to you know clocks and just just different different personal items. Wow. No, yeah, it's all it's all history. That's great. And then so the other drum sets. Did, does he? Did he keep his other original drum okay. sets? So the other four he has, they're all, um, you know, in, in uh, uh, custom cases, as I said, and, and they're in a uh, um, highly secured uh, vault, you know, temperature and sure. humidity controlled. And, uh, and it's, you know, kept in this vault with other Beatles memorabilia that he still has. Wow. Yeah. And that's so cool. It's good. He, he's keeping them. And it's in a weird way. It's like, it's just hopefully everyone kept their first drum set but i know personally i sold mine for like 50 bucks it was just like a little kind of you know junky percussion plus set but i'm all, every couple months i'm like man i wish i had that and ringo's no different i'm sure he's like i wish i had that premiere kit you know I'm, i feel like that's just you you always it's your first love oh yeah for sure in fact i can tell you a, a, a very cool story that that really nobody knows but um and this this just happened, and it, it's it, it's Beale related, but not drum related. But it's cool. still pretty pretty cool. Um, there was a gentleman that uh, owned uh, Ringo's crosswalk jacket, and and what that is was the the, the black jacket that you see Ringo wearing uh, on the Abbey Road cover. Yeah, and um, uh, brief story about that. You know, Ringo had it, and in 1980, he was in a relationship, and uh, that ended. And um, uh, the jacket was left behind in this 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 uh, in this woman's care, and uh, she just hung on to it. And she, she auctioned it off uh, in 2001, and uh, uh, a guy bought it, and hung on to it, and then he was planning on auctioning it uh, this year. And uh, what happened was when he when he contacted the auction house, uh, the the person uh, that ran it. Uh, runs it uh, uh, knows Ringo and he, he said to the guy he goes you know what he goes would you be interested in maybe um, offering this to Ringo he goes I'm sure he'd like it back <laughs> so so Ringo did want it back and um, and I know the guy who owns it or owned it and um, so I get a call and it was like Garrett can you call your friend and kind of massage this uh, I said all right so what ends up happening the the, the real short version um, uh, Ring, Ringo felt, you know what, I shouldn't have to buy back what, what was mine. Yeah, that's and, kind of what I'm thinking. Yeah, and 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 this guy, you know, um, uh, you know, a very nice person, great guy. You know, his 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 version is, you know what, I bought this as an investment, you know, for, for my retirement, and um, you 
know what? I, it's going to be tough just to just to, you know give it back. So yeah. so it, without going into all the details with numbers and things, uh, a friend of mine uh, that also knows Ringo steps in, and um, he's a wealthy uh, entrepreneur, and he just said uh, I, I shared him the dilemma I was in because I said I go I went from a guy that was uh, told to massage the deal to now it's my responsibility to try to talk this person into getting giving the jacket back to Ringo. And, mm. um, uh, and I said, I felt like I never let him down with anything that I've done for him. And I, I, I go, I just feel like I'm, I'm boxed in. I, I, I don't know what I do. Yeah. So this person said, um, uh, you know what? Call a guy, and make the deal. And he goes, and uh, I go, yeah, I go with what? You know, and he goes, I'll buy it. He goes, I'll buy it and I'll give it to Ringo. And he goes, you know what? Wow. He goes, Actually, he goes, you're negotiating this. He goes, uh, he goes, we're going to get it. And he goes, we're going to give it to Ringo. So we made, the deal. we made the deal. And then, uh, so, so, you know, we're, we're talking and I said, well, how, how, um, how are we going to get this to him? I said, we, do we want to wait to his 80th birthday in July? And he said, no, 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 no. We got to get it to him sooner. He goes, Let's make it an early birthday gift. So I said, okay. So, um, uh, Ringo has no idea about this. And in fact, when I keep getting asked, how you doing? I go, I'm working on the guy, <laughs> you know, it's, I just need more time. I go, but he's not going to auction it. So you don't have to worry about it. It's not, it's not going to, it's, it's not going to go into another stranger's hands. And, uh, uh so, so we, we had the jacket, um, we go to, uh, I, I call making a, a appointment to, to go to Ringo's house, um, on February 22nd was a Saturday. And uh, so I fly in and uh, this other gentleman flies in and we meet. And it's, so he's got the jacket and a uh, garment bag, uh, which is what it came in uh, you know, from the, uh, uh, this previous owner. And I said, I go, can't just give it to him like that. I go, it should be gift wrap. <laughs> so we go into this uh, store in Beverly Hills to, to, to get the uh, jacket gift wrapped. And, and the woman said, Hey, you know what? We're, we're I'm short staffed. We're busy. Come back in an hour. And it's like, you can't leave this, you know? So, no. so we tell her, I said, here's what we got and here's who it's going to, you know? So boom, they, they, they took care of it. So wow. we, we go to Ringo's house and, um, a little funny thing I have to tell you, I, uh, we both get out of the car, Ringo standing out in the driveway and they, uh, uh, he puts his arms out and he goes, give me a hug, brother. So I give him a hug. And then uh, this gentleman who, who, who does know Ringo, but not well, um, he comes up to Ringo with his arms out and then Ringo backs up and throws out an elbow. He goes, elbow bump, I don't want germs. <laughs> and, then, and then I'm thinking to myself, oh my God, this guy just spent a fortune. Oh my God. <laughs> so, so, so we, go, we go into the house and um, Ringo opens the, uh, the box. I mean, he takes the lid off. You know, it, it, uh, Jack was covered with really fancy tissue paper. So Ringo jokingly says, oh, you got me a box of tissue paper. <laughs> you know, said, no, 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 no. So, so he sees the, the jacket and it doesn't click. He, just, he goes, oh, you got me a black jacket. And then he, he pulls it out and me and uh, my friend are saying, that's history. That's your jacket. And, and he's going like, what? And they go, that's your jacket. And he goes, oh Abbey Road? I go, yes. And he just went, he just went speechless. He, he, just, he just was staring at it, and he put it on. He puts his arm through the sleeve, and he says, I got short arms. He goes, this, this fits. This is my jacket. I go, <laughs> your jacket. And he really got uh, emotional, and he started sure. walking down a hallway. And then, so he started following him, and then he goes, let's walk like we're crossing the Abbey Road. Oh, my you know? God. And uh, but there, and there was no pictures of that, but um, but God. he got it. He he um, thanked us, and then he just disappeared. And then I thought, God, that's weird. And because um, I thought he'd want to hear how he got it and things. And then Barbara comes out, and then she just said, um, "Thank you both very much. You just made my husband very very happy." And wow. Then then Ringo came out, and I guess he had to just compose himself and. Uh, um, and he just thanked us, hugged us, you know, he had a nice conversation with him. And, um, but he was, he was just, uh, he couldn't believe, he, you know, I guess he just kept saying, he goes, I, I can't believe they did this for me. Hmm. So, um, uh, that, that was a very special moment for me. That's unbelievable. I mean, that you have the opportunity to do these things through, 
your passion for the Beatles, which I mean, from what I understand what you're saying, you basically built this business of, you know, being involved in this from the ground up and, and look at where it got you. I mean, that's that kind of yeah. just goes to show that you have, if you're dedicated and passionate about anything, you can you could hang out with Ringo. <laughs> you can yeah. hang out with the Beatle. Yeah, it, it, it's a very it's a very fascinating story. And, and for me, this is all very normal. I found that I'm not a starstruck person. Yeah. But 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 I um uh I can see when when I'm when you know when I'm around Ringo or if other celebrities are there, you know you, you you and you see the way they respect him and treat him. Yeah, you know it just makes me realize you know like I, like I pinch myself. It's like how did I get here? What are the what are the odds? But but the 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 the, the life story for me is like follow your passion because you if you never know where it's going to lead. And and I've never expected anything. I never asked him for anything. Mm. All I keep doing is even with this whole jacket and, 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 and doing that, it makes me feel good because the reality is, you know, he, he's on my mind in my life, the Beatles, him, you know, every day, you know, since the time I, I saw them at seven. So he's done so much for me and affected my life so much for me able to do something positive for him and not expecting anything in return is, is very satisfying just to say, thank you. You know, um, uh, and, yeah. and, 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 and I think he respects me tremendously. I, I would say that with, with confidence because I, I've never asked for anything and, and he knows I have no hidden agenda. Yeah, really. And, and, uh, and there was one time, um, after I put all his kits together and I did the auction and, and, uh, uh, some other personal things, you know, he, he, uh, you know, he would see me. I would never, you know, try to start a conversation. I would just say, "Hey, how you doing?" And um, but this one particular time, he just came in, sought me out, and he came up to me and just said, um, "Thank you, thank you, thank you." He goes, "Thank you for everything you've done." And he said, um, "Because of your research," he said, um, uh, "I've learned a lot of things I didn't know, and more importantly, uh, you brought back fond memories of things that I had forgotten." And when he said that, I mean, I, I couldn't help but cry. So, um, so, so he's, uh, he's, he's a great guy. He, he's, I, I can't say enough about him. And we're not even talking about his drumming. <laughs> you know, so. <laughs> no, but I think him as a person is just, you know, it, he is drumming. And I think that, that is the opposite of the whole don't meet your heroes kind of thing because they're not, you know, it might ruin it for you. It sounds like it was more than you ever thought possible. And, and, and he just seems like such a great guy. Yeah. You know, there's one thing that was interesting. It was, there was uh, one time uh, Ringo was touring and uh, uh, was there for sound check. And I, I know uh, Craig Bissonette, uh, who drums with Ringo on tour. And uh, Greg and I are good friends. So I'm standing behind Ringo. Ringo's playing boys. And um, uh, I look over at Greg and Greg's looking at me and he has this habit of like smiling and sticking his tongue out and stuff, you know, so. But but I just noticed certain things about Ringo's playing, and and I said to to Greg, um, I go, hey, can we talk for a minute and just be serious? I said because I just really experienced something that that just was like so obvious. And he said, yeah, what's what is it? I said, um, you know, well, I just noticed like you know the little things Ringo playing heel up, all that kind of stuff. I go, but the the point I wanted to make was he's got that it factor. Uh, and, and you know, and 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 I always say that you know, if if you took an example of, you took one guitar, had it tuned, you had three guitarists that all know the same song, and you ask each one of them to play the song. One of them that has the it factor is going to have everybody going like, "Whoa, yeah, what are you what, exactly? What are you doing?" Ringo's got that. He, yes. he's got it. He's got it. He's got it. And 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 Greg just said, um, "Gary, you're right." He goes, it, I, "He goes every time I play with him, he goes, I, I, I you, you just feel it." And, um, and, and that's a big part of what he's got, you know, he's, he's just, he's just got that magic touch. Mm, absolutely. That's a great way to put it. And, and, and it's just the right place, right time. The, the, even the, the audio engineering technology, the recording technology changing at that time with Jeff Emmerich and all of this stuff, it's just it's like a perfect concoction of, 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 uh, everything is just right at that, at that place. And I think Ringo's the perfect drummer and it's just an absolute icon. Um, so now as we kind of wrap up here, 
You mentioned a little bit earlier about the bass drum head. I heard a story, and just maybe you can fill me in on it. Isn't there something where, like, originally Ludwig didn't have their logo on the head, and then he wanted it painted on there because he was so proud to play Ludwig? You might have talked about it a little bit before, but isn't there something with that? Yeah, the, 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 the true story there is that when Ringo uh, first saw his, 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 his first Ludwig kit, it did say Ludwig. Ludwig there was a Ludwig um, decal on, on the head. Hmm. And, and, but the, the little twist is that Ringo said, um, you know, after he, he, he buys the kit, he said the salesman starts trying to peel the, the, uh, the Ludwig uh, decal off. And Ringo goes, no, what are you doing? He goes, no, 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 just leave that on. It's Ludwig, it's American. He goes, I, I want that on. Oh, man. So, why, was, why was he peeling it off? Like, what, does, is that something they did? Uh, I, I have no idea. R- Ringo didn't, didn't say. I, That's I, so I, funny. Yeah, yeah. So, but what happened was uh, when you look at early pictures of Ringo playing that kit, and if, if you can kind of trace a timeline, you'll notice that you'll see, you'll see that Ludwig decal keeps, you know, from, from right to left, it just keeps losing letters. And um, uh, the one story that I heard was that uh, John would always pick at it and he got it down to where it just said L-U. <clears throat> and then he would be making jokes on stage about Ringo and the Lou or, you know, bathroom jokes. Oh, that's funny. So, um, but but then the the decal was completely removed, and um, uh, then it was uh, painted on. Wow, cheeky John! <laughs> yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that's great. Any other um, just little Ringo stories? Well, let me ask you this too. So, is there any truth to the the comments that people will say that Hal Blaine played on certain Beatles songs, or Bernard Purdy played oh, yeah, on Beatles? Songs? Yeah, you know, you no, know, it's it's all Ringo. And in fact, you know, it was. A, a few years ago, I uh, did a talk at the Delaware Drum Show, and then uh, Bernard Purdy was uh, also there as a guest to do a talk. And um, all I kept getting was, you know, some of the people were coming up thinking it was going to be, all right, Gary, you're going to call him out. <laughs> and it's like, not doing that. And, you know, no. and, and, and Bernard is a very, very nice guy. But why he ever said that and why he sticks to it, I, I have no idea. Um, that there's, there's no proof. I mean, you know, Ringo's drumming is so distinctive. Yeah. All the isolated tracks now that you can listen to, they're, you know, they're, they're, it, it, just, it, just doesn't, it just doesn't fit. And, and um, interestingly, at the, at the drum show, I was the first one to talk. And then um, about an hour later, then Bernard uh, did his session. And, uh, and when he was finished, you know, he see that there was packed, you know, so he, but he set the table by saying, okay, I'll take questions. But, you know, it was basically, I'm not going there. You know, oh, was, man. it was like, he knew, you know, and, uh, yeah. um, uh, but, but he just shut it down before it even got started. And, um, mm. uh, but, but yeah, but he's, he's a, he's a very nice guy and very talented. Just, just a, a gentleman. Yeah. That's funny. And, and he's just known as being like the, like the boastful kind of like I'm the best kind of guy, very nice. But but maybe it was like a you know it started as like a you know I'm the man I could play with the Beatles, and then it just turned into something crazy um, from there. But um, cool. Well, it, I mean the Beatles are sort of surrounded with conspiracies and things, obviously. So that's also probably part of it with like you know the whole Paul is dead thing. Maybe maybe that's that's Ringo's conspiracy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well. Any other uh, fun little Ringo tidbits you might want to share? Like, uh, I mean, he, he seems like a great guy. Anything back in like the, you know, the, 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 the far out days of the uh, mid 60s that, that were are worth sharing? Um, well, th- th- there's a lot of things. I, I, you know, some, I, I am working on a book, so, so there's a lot of cool things that are going to come out. But what, what I found, an interesting thing that, that, that I would um, note is that, um, uh, normally, if, if people you know are, have an opportunity to re- meet Ringo, um, they're they're normally told, okay, you know what? Um, if you meet him, uh, don't freak out, don't go bringing up the Beatles, you know, don't turn it into a, a grand you know inquisition, and you know, it's just just you just chill. But but for me, Ringo knows me is is like this this Beatle drum guy. So, so he likes to share information. And it's sometimes if I, 
you know, I, I never say, hey, I got a list of questions here. I'll just kind of say something during a conversation. And uh, one little thing I can tell you, there was a gentleman uh, that worked for Zildjian uh, named John De, De Christopher. He was like artist relations. And uh, he, he had sent me a text. Um, Ringo was on, on tour and he said, Gary, he goes, I'm going to be seeing Ringo. And he goes, uh, check this picture out. And it was a, a, a photo of a Zildjian symbol. And he goes, I'm going to give this to him. So uh, uh, just so what happens is he, he gives it to Ringo or he gives it to Ringo. And um, uh, they don't really connect. Ringo doesn't really play it, whatever. So uh, a few weeks later, I, I'm with Ringo, and uh, Ringo says, hey, he calls Greg Bissonette over, and he goes, um, uh, what, what's the name of that symbol? And then, you know, Greg says, Zin. And he said, uh, Gary, he goes, he, goes, what? he goes, what's a Zin symbol? He goes, a guy gave me a Zin symbol, and he says, I used it. He goes, I never used it. I never even heard of Zin. So I said, well, I go, actually, you did. <laughs> and he goes, I did? I said, yeah. So, so he tells Jeff Chonis, his drum tech, he goes, you got that symbol? Can you bring it here? You know, so Jeff brings it. And then so, so I said, Ringo, I, go, I, I knew in advance that, that this guy was giving it to you. I go, so I, I have a picture on my phone. I go, it's from 67. You're sitting behind your drum kit in, in Abbey Road Studios, and you can see a portion of the symbol. You can see the Zinn symbol stamp. And you could even, and it was, it was a, a sizzle symbol. I said, you can even see one of the rivets. So unfortunately, the Zin symbol that this guy gave Ringo, that, that, that John gave Ringo, had like a, a, a more modern Zin logo. So Ringo's looking at it and he goes, I can't see it that closely on the phone. I said, well, if it was on a TV screen, you'd be able to see that it's a Zin. I go, and, and, and that's what you played. So, so, so he says, well, what does this sound like? I go, every Zin, I go, I, I found was like, not sounded too good. I go, I don't know how you got such a good sound out of yours. So Ringo says, well, let's try it. So I, I'm given the symbol and I got my index finger through the center hole. And then Jeff gives me a drumstick to hit it. And, and everybody's standing in a circle. And all of a sudden I, I go to hit it. Now you look at Ringo. I go, what, what am I hitting it for? You hit it. I go, you're the one with the magic touch. Hey, you're Ringo. Yeah. So, so he hits it. And we all just look at each other. And it's like, yeah, it does suck. Yeah. <laughs> So, uh, but it was just, but the, 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 the Q part is, you know, uh, um, uh, yeah, he's not a techie. You know, he didn't even know what, what brand symbols he was using. That's so funny. Yeah. I can't believe that he used that Zin, which again is just like a, I mean, that's just not sheet metal, but it's just like a, you know. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And you know, it's funny because it, it, it's, uh, it was like a five rivet, um, uh, 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 sizzle. And so you hear it on songs like, you know, let's say that, like the, the final hit, you know, on the symbol at the end of like in my life, yeah. you hear it on, um, uh, with a little help from my friends, you hear it on, uh, something. Wow. You know, it just sounds, it just sounds good. Well, it's gotta be I, part of that could be the amazing recording techniques yeah. they were experimenting with and, and, uh, and all that. So that's unbelievable. Uh, well, you know, what else is interesting too is, is it with, with his drum kit tuning, especially towards the end with, you know, using a lot of the, uh, you know, uh, tea towels and things, you know, that there was uh, yep. some person that I cannot remember their name, you know, just said that he was in the studio and he says, and he, you know, uh, nobody was there. So he said he was, he was Gary, because I was hitting like the uh, ring, ring those uh, heads and he goes, everything just sounded like out of tune and crappy. <laughs> you know, so, uh, but, but, you know, however they did it in the studio, it, it worked. Yeah. I mean, that's like a, that everyone kind of if you're experienced in recording you know that if it sounds sort of crappy in the room then you go in the control room and it's going to be it's going to sound great you know yeah. that's not always the case but it'll sound better in recording because you can you know you kind of want that more flat sound as opposed to a way cranked snare so man you're like you you are ringo's living memory you know what i mean <laughs> yeah which is kind of it's an honor it, it, yeah it, it really and, and truly is yeah I, I'm, I'm not a religious guy but i am blessed beyond belief to, absolutely to this as a fan well it's it's your hard work and your dedication and um and i really appreciate you taking the time to uh share all this with us today and um before we wrap up i want to give a quick shout out to andy dwyer who reached out via Facebook and was just recommending some people and uh, he helped get us connected. So I really appreciate it. I love when all you guys and girls out there do that. And um, 
can help out with the show. So, um, yeah, Gary, why don't you tell people where they can find you? Tell them your website. You said you're working on a book. Give us that whole run through and then we'll, uh, we'll wrap it up. Okay. Well, the website is Ringo's Beetle, singular, uh, kits, plural, uh, dot com. And uh, the contact information is there. Um, the book is, uh, it's, it's been a slow process, <laughs> but um, too many distractions. But, um, but, but that's coming along. Um, uh, right now, it looks like it'll, it'll be coming out um, uh, uh, first quarter, second quarter of next year. That's great. And you have a lot of, yeah, a lot of uh, uh, information that, that um, uh, never been told. That's cool. And you obviously do presentations on this, like you mentioned at like the Delaware Drum Show with Joey Boom. And uh, there's the Chicago Drum Show. Hopefully that, that's going to take place in May. And um, yes, I can go into the UK in October for the um, uh, vintage drum show uh, there in Coventry. That's great. Um, yeah. And then I got a few other talks I'll, I'll be doing around around the country while I'm in the UK, like in London at uh, I can't remember the name of the place, but, um, uh, but in, in, yeah, London, Wales. So man, yeah. Follow your dreams. You know, you can tell you this, this is what can happen. Yeah. Yeah. It's everybody follow your dreams, follow your passions. Cause you never yeah. know. Great. Well, Gary, as Ringo says, peace and love. And, uh, sure. I appreciate you being on the show. Thanks so much. And, and I, uh, I recommend I'll put all your info in the show notes and everyone should keep an eye out and go check out Gary at a uh, drum show near you. Thanks, Bart. I appreciate it.